So let's begin with the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So we want to prove then that the derivative of the integral of a to x f of t dt gives back the original function evaluated at this point x. So our first step is going to be to replace the derivative with what it actually is. So it's the limit as h approaches 0 of the difference quotient. So the function evaluated at x plus h minus the function evaluated at x and then divided by the change in x, which is h. Now for most of the values in our interval a, b that x could take on, this h value could be positive or it could be negative. The exceptions to that are the endpoints, so the value a and the value b. So in the case of a, h can only be positive. In the case of b, h can only be negative because the function isn't necessarily even defined outside of the interval a, b. Now, in the case that h is positive, that's going to mean that x plus h is greater than x. So that means that we can split this integral into two parts by the additivity property. We can split it into the integral from a up until x of f of t dt, plus then the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt. Now why do we want to do that? Well, if we plug this in the place of this here, you can see that the integral from a to x is going to cancel with this minus the integral from a to x, and we'll just be left with this bit. So performing that substitution, this limit here simplifies to this. The limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over h, which is still there, and now the thing in the numerator has simplified, and we're just left with the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt. So that's what happens when you take this, substitute it in, and then cancel this with this. You're just left with this bit. So that's what we do when h is greater than 0. Let's now think about when h is less than 0. And remember, we don't need to worry about h being 0 because the difference quotient isn't even defined when h is equal to 0. So these are the only two cases we need to think about. h is less than 0. In that case, x plus h is now no longer bigger than x. It's actually less than x. It's on the left of x. So this time, there's absolutely no point splitting up this one by additivity. Instead, what we want to do is split this one up by additivity. So we're going to write the integral from a to x, f of t dt, and we're going to split it into the integral from a to x plus h, which remember is now less than x, f of t dt, plus the integral from x plus h, which again, remember, is less than x, 2x, f of t dt. And that works because that point x plus h is on the left of x. Then what we can do is we can substitute this in in place of here, and you'll see that the integral from a to x plus h is going to cancel with this one here. So I've performed that substitution here and it leads to this simplification of the integral. So again remember this bit cancels with this bit and you're then left with minus times this. So you get minus 1 over h times the integral from x plus h to x of f of t dt. So here comes a second new definition for integration for this video, and again it's a definition that's going to spare our notation, and it's going to mean that we don't have to write these two separately, that we can just write one, and indeed we're going to write this one. So here's our function f, and it's defined over this interval a, b, and the lower boundary of the interval is being denoted a, and the upper boundary is being denoted b. We are now going to define what this means, the integral of f of t dt, but with the boundaries written the wrong way. So you've got the upper boundary written at the bottom and the lower boundary written at the top. And we're going to define that to be the integral with the boundaries written the correct way around, so the lower boundary at the bottom and the upper boundary at the top of the function, but then you have to put a minus sign in front of it. Now, why are we going to define it like that? Well, it works beautifully. It helps beautifully. If you consider this second case where h is less than 0, in this case, this is the lower bound, x plus h, and this is the upper bound of the interval that we're integrating over. Because remember, x plus h is going to be less than x if h is less than 0. So what we can now do is we can write those bounds the wrong way around, we can bring the x plus h one to the top and the x, which is the bigger one, the upper bound, to the bottom and then swallow that minus sign in 
as this rule tells us to. And then what this becomes is the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over h integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt. And you see how wonderful that is now. That's the same as this. So with this definition, we can write the simplification of this limit just as this for both h is greater than 0 and h is less than 0. So this is an excellent definition. And it's a definition that is no doubt also familiar to you from calculus. And the sort of intuition you can have is that if we're integrating from b to a, we're kind of integrating backwards. And we want, therefore, to kind of get an area that is opposite to the area that you're getting if you integrate forwards. And that's why we want to put the negative sign there. To add more weight to this argument for why this is a good thing to do, it means that it works beautifully consistently with additivity. So if you look at this rule that we applied up here, this was the additivity property, and we said it was only going to work when h is greater than zero. Well, actually, if we have this definition now, this rule is actually also going to work for h is less than zero. And let me explain that. So if h is less than zero, x plus h is actually going to be to the left of x. It's going to be less than x. So if you split it into the integral from a to x of f of t dt, that's going to get the integral all the way up to x. But then we've got the integral from x to x plus h, which is a backwards integral. It's coming from above and going backwards. And that's going to subtract off, therefore, the area that is too much, the area that you've overcounted in here because you've gone too far. So actually this rule is going to work with this new definition for negative h. So this is a beautiful definition, beautifully consistent with additivity, so it's a good one to make. So overall, where we've got to so far is that the difference quotient for positive and negative h can be rewritten thus. So we need to show that the limit of this as h approaches 0 is equal to this value f of x. So the next step is going to be to write out the full definition of what it means for this function, which is a function of h, to converge to this value as h approaches 0. So here is the epsilon delta definition of that. So for all epsilon greater than 0, there must exist a delta greater than zero such that, now we'll come back to this little technicality in a moment, such that for all the h values that are within the delta interval around zero, and that's captured by the fact that the modulus of h is less than delta, then the value of the function will be inside the epsilon interval around the value of the limit. So this is the epsilon interval around that value, f of x plus epsilon, f of x minus epsilon. And this is the value of our function of h, so 1 over h, the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt, we need it to be inside there. So we need to show that we can find such a delta, such that as long as the h is inside this delta interval around 0, the value of the function is inside this epsilon interval around f of x. And if we can show that such a delta exists for all epsilon, then we will have shown that the value of the function gets and stays indefinitely close to the value of the limit, as h gets closer to zero. Now, what's this technicality here? Well, this is capturing the fact that we only want h's that are actually relevant to our domain of definition. So remember, the initial function f is only defined over the interval a, b. It's not necessarily defined on the rest of the real line. The area function also is only then defined on this interval a, b. So we do not want h values that are going to take us outside of the domain of definition because things become meaningless outside the domain of definition. That's what this is capturing. It's saying for all h values that take you into a point that is still within the domain of definition. So for instance, consider the point a here, the lower boundary of the interval. You would not want to consider any negative h values in that case. So you'd actually only be looking at the half interval the half delta interval in that case, just the positive values of h. Similarly for b, you'd only be looking at the negative values of h. For the points in the middle, the delta interval is then going to be the two-sided interval. You'll be looking at both the ones to, that are positive values of h and negative values of h. That is what this is capturing. So given an x value that might be here, you need your h to take you only to bits that are still in the domain. So what we are effectively doing is shifting this whole interval 
to the left a little bit. So we're imagining that the x point is our new origin and we want to look at what values of h are still going to take us in the domain and that's equivalent to subtracting x off. That's going to translate the whole interval along to the left and that's going to give us h values that will then still keep us in our domain of interest. So that's what this is saying. For all h that are in this interval, meaning that they would take you, you know, if you look at x plus h, you're guaranteed to still be in the interval a, b, such that mod of h is less than delta. So that's all that technicality is saying. It's making sure that we're only talking about h values that actually keep us in the domain of interest where the function is defined. So how am I going to prove this? Well, I'm going to begin by saying let epsilon be greater than zero, and I'm going to show for a general epsilon that I can find a delta such that this holds true. Now, how am I going to produce you this delta? Well, I'm actually going to use continuity of the original function f to find the delta. So if you remember right back to the beginning of the video when we set out the criteria for the first fundamental theorem of calculus to hold, one of the criteria was that the original function f had to be continuous everywhere over the domain, so everywhere over the closed interval a, b. Now you might have wondered at the time, why did I demand that? Yes, we used it afterwards to show that the function was Riemann integrable, but surely I could have just put the condition that the function f is Riemann integrable. Why did I demand that it was actually stronger than Riemann integrable? Why did I demand that it was continuous? Well, here's why it is necessary for the fundamental theorem of calculus to hold true, and here's where we're going to use it in the proof. So we're now going to take our epsilon that we've got here and we're going to plug it into the definition for continuity at the point x. So continuity definition tells us for all epsilon there will exist a delta. So for this epsilon there will exist a delta and this is actually going to be the delta that we'll end up using over here such that for all x prime is in the domain of interest where the function is actually defined, so the interval a, b, such that x prime is inside the delta interval around x, so the interval x minus delta to x plus delta, then the value that x prime is mapped onto by the function f of x prime will be inside the epsilon interval around f of x, so the interval f of x minus epsilon to f of x plus epsilon. I've drawn a picture here to help aid understanding, so here is our interval a, b, this is our function f, here is our point x, and here is the value it's being mapped onto, f of x. So given the epsilon that we've got here, we can then construct the epsilon interval around f of x. So we've got f of x minus epsilon to f of x plus epsilon. And by the continuity of the function f at the point x, it is guaranteed that I will be able to find you a delta such that if you construct that delta interval around x, so here it is, x minus delta to x plus delta, then all of the points that are in that interval and also actually in the domain AB, so that's taking account of the uh, points at the boundary, so the point A and the point B, where of course any delta interval is always going to contain points that are outside of the actual domain of the function. So we're only interested in the points that are in the delta interval and are actually inside our domain of interest. But all of those points that are inside that interval and inside the domain are mapped into the epsilon interval around f of x. That's what we get from continuity of the function at x, that such a delta interval exists. Now my claim is that I can use this same delta up here and that if I pick h values such that the modulus of h is less than delta, then it's going to be the case that the value of this function is also going to be inside the epsilon interval around f of x. So if you think about this, if mod of h is less than delta, well, consider now positive h's for a moment. That's going to mean that x plus h is going to be one of these x prime values that's still inside this delta interval around x. Or if you consider negative h values, then that's going to mean x plus h is less than x, again that's going to mean that it's going to be one of these x prime values that's in this delta interval around x. So let's just have a play around with this and see if we can get anywhere. So let's simplify it firstly. Let's firstly just consider positive h values 
And let's assume that our x point is a point where positive h values are relevant, which is all points apart from the upper bound of the interval b. And let's also get rid of this 1 over h for now and just think about the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt. So x plus h is bigger than x because h is positive. So on the picture, here is x, here is x plus h, which of course is going to be inside of the delta interval if we're making h modulus less than this delta. And here, therefore, is what's intuitively meant by the value of this integral, this area here. So what we want to try and do is get some bound on the value of this, because we're trying to show that it divided by h is inside this interval. Now, what do we know? Well, we know the value of this integral is always going to be less than or equal to an upper Riemann sum of the function over that interval, because it, after all, is the infimum of all of the upper Riemann sums. So the greatest lower bound, it is a lower bound for them. Similarly, we know that it's always going to be greater than or equal to any lower Riemann sum of the function over this interval because it's the supremum of the lower Riemann sums, so it's an upper bound for them all. So if we can get some good choice of upper and lower Riemann sums, then we could bound the value of this in between those two values.